All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Good. Welcome to this class. Welcome to our students online as well. Good morning, yeah, sir. Much better. Thank you so much. All right. Let's just get into what we studied uh, the previous week. We looked at chapter two, right? The the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we established a fact that the gospel is more than enough when you're sharing to people, right? We don't need to add anything extra. We don't have to remove everything from anything from it. The gospel can be just five minutes. And we studied in First Corinthians, we said the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So it's not the person, right? We may be somebody very insignificant. We may be somebody who don't know the scriptures. That's all right. But when we are sharing the gospel, when we share the message of Jesus, it is the power of God unto salvation. Yes? Right? But we also saw the other aspect. The, the gospel is, is foolishness to those who are perishing. Right? So for those who it doesn't mean anything, it's foolish. But it's the wisdom of God unto salvation. Right? So you and I, as believers, when we begin to share the gospel, we must understand this should be our foundation. right? Because if our foundation is on anything else, for example, the way I speak, or the way we look, or the way we minister, or the way our eloquence of speech, all of that is important. But if that is the foundation, we will fail. Our foundation must be the gospel is powerful. And God has commissioned us to share the gospel, right? We looked at the word sozo, right? How many of you remember the word sozo, right? We saw that it is a big word. It has saved, healed, delivered, redeemed, blessed, delivered from the works of the devil. We are uh, healed both in our body, in our spirit, in our soul, in our mind. Uh, and so when we become a believer, we receive sozo. It's not like our name is written in heaven and we are happy. That's not the end of it. There is so much eternal life begins when we receive the Lord Jesus as our personal savior, right? So we looked at different ways also we can share the gospel, gospel in five minutes, gospel in two minutes. And let's get into chapter three today, power and love. Now, even as we keep sharing the gospel, it is very easy for us as believers to become very rude. We can become arrogant. We can think of ourselves very high of ourselves. Right? Now remember the Lord Jesus, who is the Son of God, He ministered in power and love. Nowhere we see when the Lord Jesus was doing His ministry, was did he minister out of hatred? Right? Because people came, Romans came, Gentiles came to him, people from different backgrounds came to him, people who are immoral, they came to him. But we see that everywhere Jesus ministered in love. Right? So let's read a couple of verses, right? First one, uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. So uh, for those who are online, we don't have an additional mic this morning. So, you know, you can just follow along on your Bibles. But I request anyone here can read Matthew chapter 9 and verse 36. Another person can open to Matthew chapter 14 and verse 14. Somebody else can also open Matthew 15, 32 and Mark 6, 34. Quickly. Go ahead, read. Matthew 9, 36. Yeah. When he saw the multitudes, who, when Jesus saw the multitudes, his heart was moved with passion. It was not like Jesus was standing there and saying, oh, now I'm famous. 
now people know me or now i will start a big ministry now no. his heart was moved with compassion need the next one matthew 14 14. This verse says, he was moved with compassion and healed those who were sick. Right? Next one, Matthew 15, 32. Right. Thank you. So Matthew 15, here we, in, in Matthew 15, there are crowds of people, hundreds of people following Jesus. And they've been with Jesus for three days. Now picture this, three days they've been with Jesus. Probably whatever they have, they've, the food is over. And Jesus is saying, I have compassion on them because they've been with me for three days. So he makes sure that they get what they need at that time. Matthew, sorry, Mark 6, 34. Right. So again, when Jesus came out, he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. He was moved with compassion. So what can you and I learn from this? Each one of us as believers, we must minister in compassion. Compassion, love. Love is the greatest gift that God has given each one of us. You know, it's very easy in ministry to put up a show. Very easy. I have seen people do it. I've gone, traveled all across India, and I've seen how it is to put up a show. You can put up a show. But Jesus didn't do that. What did he do? He ministered in compassion, in love. That should be the root of our ministry. I do ministry because I love God and I love people. If the reason we want to do ministry is because we want to become famous, we want to start a church and we want the pulpit, you know, people should see us, people should recognize us, people should call us pastor or people should call us prophet, apostle for fame. If that is the reason, then we have failed. Because Jesus didn't do that. What did he do? He moved with compassion. He loved them. That is why he did all of it. What does John 3.16 say? God so of the world. So, very important. Each one of us. Now, you know, when I joined ministry, I was a little boy. Probably 20 years old, I started preaching. But I didn't understand so many things. I didn't understand that ministry is about love. And I got to love people. Sometimes, you know, when we are young, we want to do so much for God. That's wonderful. But I wish there was somebody who told me when I was young, get your foundations right. So each one of you, get your foundation right. Why you're doing what you're doing? You ask yourself, right? So you go back to your rooms. Pray and ask God, God, fill me with your love that I can minister to people and I can do your ministry. And that's what Jesus did, right? So let's look at it. First one, we minister in power. John chapter 14, uh, 1 through 13. You can keep reading it. I may, I may stop you in between. John chapter 14, verse 1 through 13.
Just move to chapter 12. Move to chapter 12. Sorry, verse 12. Fourteen verse twelve, verse twelve onwards. Okay, I just want let's focus on this verse, right? Verse twelve says, "I tell you the truth, anyone." Say, everyone say, anyone, anyone, right? Anyone, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have done. He will do even greater things than this because I'm going to the Father. Now, who is testifying of this? Who's saying this? Jesus. Jesus is telling his disciples, see, if you have faith in me, greater things than what I did, you will do. So Jesus is giving his disciples a commission, right? Now, in the Greek, the word greater does not mean in essence, right? Now, let me explain. Jesus walked in water. Can we walk on water? Okay. Now, the essence is not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about greater meaning in numbers, in quantity, right? Jesus ministered for how many years? Three and a half years. He did certain did miracles. But when he's talking about the church, he's talking the greater things you will do. It is about numbers. Like we're doing more than what Jesus did right now in terms of numbers. Right? So if you look all across the world, there are millions and millions of miracles that are happening, even though today. Right? So the numbers are more. Now, Jesus is saying, greater works than what I did, you will do. And he's saying this with just one criteria. What is that criteria? If you have, if you have faith, faith in me, that's all he wants, right? He says that if you have faith in me, greater things than what I did, you will do, right? So the Lord Jesus encourages us, he's exhorting us to be men and women or believers to walk in power. Right? Power is very important, right? Power and compassion is like salt and, uh, you know, sugar and salt or salt and pepper. You need them, right? They, they go together. God has called us to walk in power, but also to walk in love. Right? Now, what, how does power come? What does the Bible teach us? Acts chapter 1. Come on. We should know this. Acts 1. Verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Right? So the moment you and I are filled with the Holy Spirit, we will receive power. The Greek word to be witness means to be willing to... The Greek word witness here means martyr. So if you look at the original Greek, you will be... You, you know, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be willing... You'll be filled with power to be a martyr for Jesus Christ. Everyone know what martyr is? Uh, martyr means somebody who's willing to give their life for Jesus, like the disciples, right? Somebody's willing to give their life. Now, look at this best example of uh, Peter. Peter and the other disciples, when Jesus was dying, where were they? At the cross, where, was Jesus, where were the other disciples? They were all fearful. They were all hiding. Right? 
But Acts chapter 2 happens. The Holy Spirit comes upon them on Pentecost. They're filled with power. They're anointed of the Holy Spirit. What happens Acts chapter 3? The same Peter who was scared and afraid and running away, now he's coming and saying, coming to the temple, standing in front of all the Pharisees and saying, the people that you have killed, the person that you have killed is now alive. He is the Messiah. And through the name of Jesus, everyone will be saying, only preaching the gospel. What is, what is the difference? Same Peter, same fisherman. Now he didn't do, uh, you know, 10 years Bible college, 10, uh, 10 uh, weeks Bible college course and come. No. It was probably one and a half months or probably three months, two to three months. That's it. Same Peter, same fisherman said, Jesus, I, I don't know who's Jesus. Same person is sitting, standing here in front of all the people in Jerusalem and he's preaching with such boldness. If you read in Acts, they say, where did this fellow get all his training from? Isn't he a fisherman? What is the difference? Same person. One is fearful. Here, he's anointed by the Holy Spirit. The same Peter... When he's walking the streets of Jerusalem, his shadow is healing people. So imagine this, Peter's shadow ministry. Everyone are carrying, hey, Peter's coming. So they're carrying sick people, putting them on the streets. And as Peter's walking, they're healed. How? The anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's all it is. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here, it's the same Peter. Here, it's the same Peter, only one difference, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when you and I have to minister in power, how many of us want power? What is power in Hindi? Samarth, correct? We need power. Now, let me tell you this. You and I cannot do any kind of ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit. It will be a big zero. You understand? We can, we can know this Bible in and out. Right? But without the baptism, without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we will not be able to. Because Jesus himself said, go and wait. I'll send the Holy Spirit. They, only then you can do ministry. So for us to be powerful, to walk in the power of God, what do we need? The anointing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Every day, you and I should pray. Say, God, baptize. Baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Remove. By nature, we are fearful. By nature, by our own, we are not able to do things. By our own, can we do? We can do certain things. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I always tell people, it's easy to start a church. Especially now, we're talking about if you talk about early 1990s to early 2000s, it was a little difficult to start a church, right? You have to do so many. But now it's very easy. You're 18 years old. Go open a trust, start a church. It's easy to start a church. But what does Jesus say? You shall be known by your fruit. So if you want the church to be powerful, you as a leader, I as a leader, must ask God for the power of the Holy Spirit. Only that will make the difference. You're with me, right? Otherwise, we can start something. But there won't be any power in that. Because we need the power of the Holy Spirit, right? There were times when, you know, I've traveled across North India. And there are times when, you know, these people who are possessed by demons now, it's easy to talk about it. You know, when I studied, I got full marks in everything. I did very well in my studies, you know, in Bible college and all of that. But when I went and saw with my own eyes, on paper, it's a different story altogether. It's important to study. It's important to learn the Word of God. It's important to do well. I remember I was in... Uh, I think it was Kashmir. And we're there, and this young boy, 
maybe 20 years old, highly possessed. He came right in front. He started, he, he gave a look that shook me. I was filled with the Holy Spirit and I was prayed and all of that. And it was a conference. We had about 200 odd people there. I was probably in my early 20s, 23, 24. Right? Young boy. I knew, I thought I knew everything from the Bible. Like I studied, I looked really hard. I, and I saw that. No, all this Bible knowledge was there, but everything is gone. Because it's when you look at it, when you look at a person who's possessed, it's a different story. I'm sure most of us have seen in North India. But it's a different story altogether. We cannot say, you know, I have a degree in uh, BTH. I have two certificates in English and two certificates in... He doesn't care. You know, I get up at 5 o'clock and pray. Oh, good for you. You know, I can sing uh, 10 songs in a row. 10 worship songs, 10 praise, and, uh, praise songs. Continuously I can sing. It doesn't matter to him. But if the Holy Spirit is inside us, there will be a change. So I remember that day, I was very fearful. I went back home to the room and I prayed and I said, God, why is it that I got fear? Why was I fearful? You said, I do not have a spirit of fear, but of power, love and sound mind. But when I saw this person who's younger to me, I have so much of fear. Why is it? And I felt the Holy Spirit telling me, because you're trying to do this ministry on your own. You're trying to stand on your own ability. You're standing on your knowledge. You stand on my authority. You stand with the power of the Holy Spirit. I said, that night, I said, God, I want to change the way I minister. And I prayed and I said, God, I'm going to go back tomorrow. I'm not going to stand on my own. Stand on your Holy Spirit, on your power, your authority. I remember the next day we went, same thing happened during the prayer and the ministry time, right? All of us are praying in tongues and came. The same thing, same, exactly the same event happened like the previous day. They came and they stood. There was zero fear. And because of that zero fear, there was boldness. All of a sudden, I was saying, hey, you can't do anything. And I was able to minister, pray. Eventually, those demons left. But you see the difference. If you do something on our own, it will not last long. But when it's anointed of God, God will use us. Right? We need the power of God in ministry, especially in ministry. Right? Uh, Acts chapter 5 and verse 32. Let's read that. Acts 5 and 32. Yeah. And we are witnesses to these things and to whom God has given the Holy Spirit, right? Now, you and I, now, we know that, you know, we, all of us, we have not seen Jesus face to face, right? There will come a time we will see him face to face. But you and I are witnesses of the gospel. It says there, now, when you look, when you read the whole of Acts, in Acts 5, you see that Peter and John testify about Jesus. What does it say? We are witnesses. You are telling us that not to preach in the name of Jesus. Now, let me tell you, I'm a witness. Now, how many of you know what the meaning of a witness is? Okay, let me give you an example, right? You're going on the road, you're driving somewhere, and from far away, you see an accident. You see two bikes banged each other, and they both are fighting. But you know exactly because you're an eyewitness. You have seen everything. Okay? But they both are fighting there. So what would you do? You'll go and you'll say, hey, I saw both of you. You were actually wrong. You, this other person was going the right way. You came the wrong way. And that's why this accident. So I saw it. It's, so you're an eyewitness. 
right? So in some cases, if they call the police, police will say, who, who, who's seen the whole event that's happened? Say, hey, I'm an eyewitness. They'll take you also and go. You'll sign. You're an eyewitness. You have seen it. Now, Jesus, during Jesus' time, Peter and John were eyewitnesses. They saw Jesus. They saw his ministry. They sat with Jesus. They ate with him. They slept with him. They traveled with him. They saw him doing his wonderful ministry. Imagine 5,000 people are there. Jesus is taking five loaves of bread and two fish and saying, give everyone. How will Peter feel? What are you talking? How will the disciples feel? They've seen the miracles. The end of that uh, whole incident, 12 bags full. So it's like Jesus was saying, all the disciples take one bag home. 12 bags full. They've seen Jesus walking on water. They saw, they've seen Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. What did he do? Weep and cry? What did Jesus do in Lazarus' tomb? He said, oh, please, God, please, please, Father. Thing. Father, thank you that you... Lazarus, come forth. He came. Simple. They've seen the miracles. They're eyewitnesses. And when Jesus said, I am the Messiah, they believed. And what happened? He said he'll die. He'll rise again from the dead. That's what he did. Now Peter and John are testifying. Right? If you call some of the some of our alumni, right? alumni means those who have completed our training here, they'll testify of the college, right? Say, okay, this is this is a college, these are the subjects, this is how we studied. You know, they'll testify whether they were blessed or not, and everything. So they are eyewitnesses. Now, you and I may not be eyewitnesses, but we are witnesses of Jesus Christ. We are witnesses. And as witnesses, just like Peter and John and all the other disciples walked in power, you and I must walk in power. Let me give you this story. This, it's a real story. In the early 60s, there was a man named David Wilkerson. He was a pastor. Right? And uh, he started a church in the countryside, uh, a small church, about 100 people. And every Sunday he would go preach. But one day, as he was praying, he said, God, I'm only preaching about the Holy Spirit. I'm preaching about your power. I'm preaching about your anointing. But I don't see it. I want to see it in my life. I want to see the Holy Spirit's power working with my own eyes. So one day he was reading the newspaper. He saw in New York, that's another city, there was a lot of gangs, gang fights, and people, children, 12 years, 15 years old, you know, gang fights, and they're being killed. Now, David Wilkerson said, he was a pastor, he said, he left his comfortable life, he went to the city, and he started ministering to the people. And these are drug addicts, gangsters. Right? They could have killed him at any time. But then he saw the power of God working. Many of these gangsters, gang leaders, drug addicts, put their weapons down. And they gave their life to Christ. And he wrote a book. The name of the book is called The Cross and the Switchblade. Right? The switchblade is that blade, you know, you press it and then the knife comes out. The gangsters used to use that. So the name of his book is The Cross and the Switchblade. It's a powerful book. Right? It talks about how the cross is more powerful than any weapon in this world. Right? Let's read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Let's look at verse 4. That's so powerful. Verse 4, God also testified. Right? 
So it was not like Jesus is saying, okay, go do ministry. No. God, our Lord Jesus, he testified this gospel by signs, wonders, and miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his own will. So when you and I are doing ministry, if there's signs, wonders, and miracles, it is because God has testified it through his gospel. This is what Jesus wanted to do, and this is what will keep going on. Now let me tell you this. Any kind of bill may come. The church of God will never stop. It will never stop. Let any, any kind of persecutions will come. If you read the book of Revelations, the persecutions will grow stronger and stronger. But the church, the body of Christ, will never stop. Miracles will never stop. Signs and wonders will never stop. It will not stop. Because this is God. He is building his church. Right? So isn't that an encouragement for us? A government may say hundreds of things. But God doesn't work on that, that level. God's level is somewhere else. When God says, I will testify of the gospel with signs, wonders, and miracles. And people will see signs, wonders, and miracles. And people will be added to the church. The church is not going to stop just because some people come and burn one church. No. God is going to build the church even bigger and greater. But he needs you and us. You and me. He needs us to build his church. For that we need the power. Right? So it is it's very simple. God is saying, are you willing? If we say yes, he'll say, I'll give you the power. If we say no, he, he will not push us. He's gentle. You say, no, I don't want to do ministry. I want to do something else. Or I want to do, uh, you know, you can do anything else, right? You can start your business, do something in the corporate. But what he wants is he wants us to, you know, to share the gospel, to minister to people, signs, wonders, and miracles to happen. Right? With these signs, wonders, and miracles, God will testify the gospel. Each one of us, when we are preaching, a time will come, right? Now is the time to study. But a time will come, you will go back, you will preach, you will minister to people. And you will be surprised. When you're laying hands on the sick, they will be healed. When you lay hands on people who are brokenhearted, they will feel comforted. And you'll feel, hey, God, thank you for using me. It's not like we are perfect, right? But that is the greatest joy that we can have, to minister in power, to minister in authority, right? Next one, we minister with compassion. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Yeah, Christ died for all that we, those who live, should no, lo no longer live for themselves, but for Him. You know, let me give you an understanding of what's happening here in the church in Corinth. Now, in this church, in the church in Corinth, there was a division. Right? So if you, let's, let's just go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13. So, yeah, let me read this. Right now, verse 12 and 13. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. It says, What I mean is this one of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Cephas, still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Right now, what is happening in this church is that there is division within the church. 
Some are saying I follow Paul. Some are saying I follow Apollos. Some are saying I follow Peter. Some are saying I follow Jesus. Now, this is a big problem. Is it a problem or no? Right? When a church is divided, is it powerful? Right? Uh, for example, all of us are here. If, if, if we have to be one team, we have to have unity, oneness. Right? But if there's division, it causes chaos. Anger, jealousy, strife, hatred, all of these things will start. Right? Hey, you're in that team. And there's another group saying, I follow Paul. Another group is saying, I follow Apollos. That's a big problem. So Paul is writing and he's saying, is, is Christ divided? No, we are one body. And so the, the background of this is when Paul is saying, Jesus died on the cross for all. If we are in him, we're all included in that. So he's ministering in compassion. He's saying there's no division. There's no division in the body of Christ. Now, re remember this. When the Lord Jesus looks at us, we may be Methodist, Pentecost, or whatever the backgrounds are there. Many other things are Baptist and all kinds of backgrounds, denominations are there. That is man-made denominations. We have different styles of worship, different ways of worship, different uh, well, you know, methods of preaching. So every church is different, right? But when the Lord Jesus, he looks at us, he looks at us as one body. He's not looking at us and saying, okay, Methodist, you go sit there. Baptist, you go sit there. No, he's looking at us as one body washed by the blood of Jesus. So when we go to heaven, there is no denominations, there is no pastor, prophet, apostle, nothing. So all these you know, titles will last only for a while. When we are in heaven, one thing the Lord Jesus sees, are we washed by the blood of Jesus? Because it is true, through the cross, Christ died for us, that through, his, through the cross that we find forgiveness. We find the love of God. So, as believers, you and I must walk in this compassion. Avoid divisions. Avoid things that can cause strife and anger and jealousy. These are natural things which come into our life. But as we did in the first week, we need to lay the axe. Sometimes we may feel jealous of somebody else. Lay the axe. Say, God, I don't want this. When you pray, you say, God, I don't want to be jealous. Please remove it out of me, and the Holy Spirit will remove it. Or when you're, you know, you may feel by nature, we may feel jealous of people or angry, or we may hate people. Right? Now, for example, there are people of other faiths, and when we look at them, sometimes we may our heart may be filled with hate. How can they do this? How can they you know, follow these wrong things? How can they live in such a sin? Now, it's very important to remember that we were also in sin. That Christ died for them also. So we need to tell ourselves, God, I do remove this hatred. Remove pride. Remove anger. Right? Remove these things from my heart that I may walk in love. I love what the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13. Let's read that. Let's read 1. 1 Corinthians 13, sorry, verse 4 to 13. Let's read that entire passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 13. Yes. Okay. 
Right. So in chapter 12, Paul is writing one big passage. We have different kinds of gifts. We have prophecy, word of knowledge. We have uh, you know, speaking in tongues, working of miracles, gift of faith. He's listing down all the gifts. And the church is already flowing in all the gifts of the Spirit. Now, isn't that wonderful? Imagine a church, all of them are prophesying. There's people who can... Uh, speak in tongues, working of miracles, wonderful. But chapter 1, there, there's division. Now chapter 14, 13, he's saying, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast. Love is not proud, it's not easily angered. It does not keep a record of wrong. Love does not delight in the evil, but chooses what is right. Love never fails, gives us big list. And then he ends it by saying, these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of this is love. Everything else will cease. The gifts, the prophecy, the word of knowledge, working of miracles, everything will cease. It will stop. But the love of God will remain. So Paul is writing to a church that's already flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. So what does it teach us? We can prophesy, we can have word of knowledge, we can have gifts of the Spirit, speak in tongues, but still we can be in a place and walk in anger and jealousy and pride. Paul is saying, walk in love. The greatest of all of this is love. That is why the Lord Jesus set the example. Each one of us, even whatever we are doing, right? We come here to study, to learn. It's good to exercise spiritual gifts. It's good to study and learn. But don't forget to walk in love. Because the greatest of all this is love. Amen? The greatest of all of this. You can say, oh, I know so much. I know how to do this and that and this. That's wonderful. But are we walking in love is the question. Right? First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. Here, Paul is writing to the Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'll read a couple of verses here. First Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8. He says, we have previously suffered and have been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, or nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved of God to be entrusted with the gospel, we are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know that we never did come with flattery, nor did we speak with a mask to cover up uh, our greed. God is our witness. We are not looking for praise from men, not from you or from anyone else. So he goes on in that passage and he says, through all the hardships, Philippi was a church that was going through a lot of persecutions. Right? And Sorry, Thessalonica was a church which went through a lot of persecutions. And Paul is saying, in all those persecutions, in all those challenges and oppositions that we faced, we see the love of God. 
the love of God encouraged us. The love of the church, the people encouraged us to continue the gospel. So I want to leave us today with these two points as we minister the gospel. Two very important things. Number one is what? Love. You can say number one is love. To walk in the love of God. Number two is to walk in the power of God. Only if you love somebody will you share the gospel with them. Right now, for example, you're outside, you're seeing somebody, you may not feel love for them. There's somebody, he's just walking on the road, how can I feel love for them? But when the Holy Spirit, you ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, minister to me. That when I'm ministering to this person, I can minister in love. Holy Spirit will pour out his love upon our heart. Suddenly, we will not look at them as with hatred or with anger or with people of different uh, you know, faiths, but we will look at them with love. That's why Paul writes, no? he says, love breaks barriers. Divisions are broken when we walk in love. Right? So we'll stop here. We'll uh, pick up from chapter 4 next week. Any questions? Right? So I want to encourage each one of us. Will we do this? Right? Yes. Uh, I want to encourage you. You know, just walk in love. The love of God will teach us. The love of God will bless the work of our hands, bless our ministry, bless everything that we are doing. Right? So that your time here is fruitful. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for teaching us so wonderfully that, Lord, we are to walk in love, to walk in power. We are your children, Lord. Enable us, equip us, empower us to walk in this God kind of love, to glorify your name, Lord. Fill us with your love. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, God bless you all. God bless everyone here online. Thank you for joining. Have a great Thank week. Thank you very much, sir.